Hi guys, I hope you're doing well. This is my second lecture. This is the, a piece of section 11.2. Um, what I want to talk about is sums. So here's an example of a sum where I am adding up uh, a bunch of terms. Um, uh, 1 plus a half plus a fourth plus an eighth plus a sixteenth plus a thirty-second works out to 63 30 seconds. I want you to notice that this sequence starts, or that the, the sum starts with one, that each term is half the previous. Half of one is a half, half of a fourth, half of a half is a fourth, half of a fourth is an eighth, and so on. And there are six terms. One, two, three, four, five, six. See, I can change any of these. So for example, this is the same sort of thing, except now I'm starting at four, each term is a third of the previous, one third times a fourth, one third squared times a fourth, and so on. And now there are five terms. So all sums of this sort I can write are called geometric sums, and I can write them like this. So A is my name for the starting number, which was one in the first example and four in the second. R is what you multiply each term by to get the next term. So you multiply a by r to get a r. You multiply a r by r to get a r squared, and so on. So r was 1 half in the first example and 1 third in the second example. And then you stop when you've done it n times. So that works out confusingly to n plus 1. So n was 5 in this first example, and n was 4 in the second example. So here's that case I kept warning you about that will somehow start things at zero. Okay, so here's some problems to do. First, if I give you a, r, and n, just plug into this formula to write out the geometric sum. You don't have to add them up. And a little bit trickier, if I give you a geometric sum, figure out what a is, that's easy. Figure out what r is, what do we multiply each term by to get the next term? and figure out what n is. Remember, that's one less than the number of terms. So one of the great things, geometric sums come up all the time in mathematics. One of the great things about them is you can write a formula for what they add up to. And it's a beautiful little argument. So I want to just call that geometric sum a plus ar plus ar squared. I want to call it s. And then I want to ask what happens when I multiply s times r. Notice a times r is r, a times r is ar squared, ar squared times r is ar cubed, and so on. So r times s looks like this. And now if I compare these two, notice r times s has exactly the same terms as s, except it's kind of missing that first a, and instead it's got the next term, a r n plus 1. So what I want to do is take s minus r s, and I get a, and then plus 0, plus 0, plus 0, plus 0, minus a r to the n plus 1. So s minus rs, which I'll just write as s times 1 minus r, factoring out the s, is equal to a minus ar to the n plus 1, which again, I'll factor out the a and write it like that. And now if I divide by 1 minus r, I get a formula for s. It is a times 1 minus r to the n plus 1 divided by 1 minus r. Uh, I want to caution that that worked perfectly except in the case where r equals 1. r equals 1, this formula becomes 0 over 0. So this formula doesn't work in that case, but that's OK, because there's actually a really easy formula. Um, if you notice when r equals 1, s is really kind of silly. It's just a plus a plus a plus a n plus 1 times. So then the formula is a times n plus 1. So we'll usually forget to write that special case. Um, you'll have to remember when r is 1 not to use this formula. OK, so for example, 
if I tell you a equals 3, r equals a half, and n equals 7, you can find the sum, the quantity that the sum adds up to, by plugging in into this formula here, a, which is 3. On the top, you get 1 minus r, which is a 1 half, raised to the n plus 1, which is 8. And on the bottom, you get 1 minus r, which is 1 half. So that's 3 times 1 minus 1 over 256, all divided by 1 over 1 half. Dividing by a half is multiplying by 2. We do that subtraction, and then we do that multiplication. We get 765 over 128. Okay. So geometric sums are one example of large sums that you need to talk about in mathematics, and they're a pain to write out a lot of terms connected by plus signs. It's also not very helpful to have all those dot, dot, dots running around. You don't really understand what you're talking about. So here is a notation that allows you to write large sums economically. This is a notation used throughout mathematics and the sciences. Um, so you will want to get comfortable with it. A little intimidating at first, but really convenient. It is called sigma notation or summation notation. Um, sigma is this Greek letter here. Um, looks like a capital E, but inexplicably, it's the ancestor of our S, which stands for sum. So we write an expression like this. It will have the sigma, the capital sigma, is your indication that it represents a sum. And then let me talk you through all this decoration around it. It will always have on the bottom a variable equals a number. That variable is telling you is the index variable. Um, and the thing next to it is the start of the index. So here the index variable is k, and the index starts at 1. Up at the top, that number is called the end of the index. So here the index runs from 1 to 2. And after the summation sign, there is a formula, an expression, that usually involves the index variable. In this case, k, the expression is 1 over k squared. And that's called the term. Um, this variable k is what in mathematics is called a dummy variable. And what that means is if I scratched out k both in the summation notation and in the formula and replaced it with any other letter, n or p or q, it would represent the same sum. It is a temporary variable that I created just to be able to write this sum. Those of you who have done some programming will recognize a lot of this is like loops in programming. Um, OK, what this summation notation indicates, it's a, it's a recipe for writing out a sum. And the recipe is um, start at the start of the index and count up by ones until you get to the end of the index. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Each of those numbers plug into the formula. So 1 over 1 squared, 1 over 2 squared, 1 over 3 squared, 1 over 4 squared, all the way till you stop at 1 over 10 squared, and then add them up. Okay, So that step turned this compact little thing with the scary sigma sign into a big long thing with no scary sigma sign. And it represents that sum. In this case, with my calculator, I got that that sum was 1.54976. So any big sum can be written very succinctly that way. So here's the geometric sum, a plus ar plus ar dot dot dot, until we get to ar to the n, is written as the sum. We're going to start with a 0 and end with n. And each term looks like a r to the k. So when k equals 0, we get a r to the 0, which is a. When k is 1, we get a r to the 1, which is a r. When k is 2, we get a r to the 2, which is a r squared. We keep going till we get to a r to the n. This is another case where you should kind of stare at this and make sure that that makes sense to you, that you understand how this expression unwraps to this, and this expression unwraps to this because you're going to have to get comfortable with that. Okay, So now our formula for the geometric sum, k 
can be stated very succinctly this way. Okay, so here's some examples for you to get used to this. The sum from i equals 1 to 5 of 1 over i plus 1 squared. That's how I would say it out loud. To expand that, you plug in each number value of i from 1 to 5, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, into the term to get 1 over 1 plus 1 squared, or 1 over 2 squared. Then you get 1 over 1 plus 2 plus 1 squared, which is 1 over 3 squared, all the way up to when i is 5, you get 1 over 6 squared, and then you add these up. Okay. In this case, I'm just trying to get you to write out the sums. You don't have to plug it into your calculator and find what the sums are equal to. So here's some more problems. A trickier kind of problem is if I give you a sum not written in sigma notation to write it in sigma notation. This is a lot like if I give you a sequence, write the general formula for it. Just like in that, you want to compare it to the index. I suggested we start at 0. So in each case, you're taking 2 to 1 more than the index, right? 2 to the 0. Well, that's a mistake, sorry. Um, that should be 1. 2 to the 2, 2 to the 3, 2 to the 4, 2 to the 5, 2 to the 6. As I catch these mistakes, I will fix them in the notes. Um, on the bottom, I've written these out so that you can see in each case we're writing the index factorial. Remember, 0 factorial is 1. Surprising but true. So we'll pick whatever index variable we want, but I picked k. We go from 0 to 5. On the top, we put 2 to the k plus 1. And on the bottom, we put k factorial. So here's one for you to try. Easier than the one that I worked out for you. And I'm going to just to get you used to summation, I want to show you one very cool thing to do with summation notation. Um, I've written out um, a bunch of summations. This is a kind of silly one. The sum from k equals 1 to 1 of k is only, only has one term, which is 1. But as each case, I'm adding 1 to this top number. So by the time I get here, you see that it is really kind of an interesting sum, 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6 plus 7. And now I want you to notice that in each case, there's a nice formula for the sum. I'll show you why that formula um, works if you write it out as dots. So 1 plus 2 is a row of 1 dot and a row of 2 dots. 1 plus 2 plus 3 is 1 plus 2 plus 3. 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 is a triangle like this, and so on. This guy is a triangle of 7. I think I need one more. Um, and just by the area, you can see the number of dots here is height times width over 2. Um, you have to be a little bit sneaky. Um, uh, but in each, each case, it is 4 times 3 over 2, 5 times 4 over 2, 6 times 5 over 2. Um, and in general, if the sum goes from 1 up to some arbitrary number n, so notice here I've got two variables, the dummy variable inside the sum, and then I'm letting the top of the sum, the end of the index, vary, then the formula is always the index times one more than the index over 2. This cool formula has a neat history. I think various people knew it, but a popular story told about Gauss, who is perhaps the most brilliant mathematician of all time, is that when he was in elementary school, his teacher, I think probably because he was annoyed at the students, made them all add up the numbers from 1 to 100, uh, and uh, figuring that would keep them busy for a while. And Gauss came up a few seconds later and said, here's the answer, because he had figured out just on the fly this formula. And 
had done the calculation. Uh, that's all for now.